We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I'm Andy. And I'm Gerald. And this week we read The Skylight Room by O. Henry, a very Rami-like story submitted as a departing gift by Rami last week. <laughs> if you haven't read the story yet, <laughs> there's a link in the show notes. Spoilers ahead. In the Skylight Room, Miss Leeson boards in a fourth floor, a tiny room in a large home with many borders, in what is presumably New York in the early 1900s. Her tiny room is flanked by storerooms, and the only source of natural light is a skylight overhead. On evenings, she sits on the stoop with the other boarders. The men adore her, and the women sniff jealously. One night, Miss Leeson points out Billy Jackson, a star she can see from her skylight window, and names herself. Miss Longnecker, a school teacher, corrects Miss Leeson and says the star is Gamma. Shortly after, Miss Leeson loses her job and is unable to pay for food. While wasting away in her room, she looks up at Billy Jackson, the star. The next morning, the maid finds Miss Leeson unresponsive. They break into her room and try to revive her and fail. They call an ambulance, and the doctor who arrives is named Mr. William Jackson. The hey. story hopeful note from a newspaper which says Miss Leeson is recovering. All right. <laughs> okay. Was that, that a it? snoring sound, Gerald? Can we, can we go, can we well, go now? <laughs> I don't believe the doctor's name is Mr. William Jackson. Jackson. Oh, Mr. Because he's a doctor. Oh. He didn't go to medical school to be called Mr. William Jackson. Dr. William Jackson. Dr. Billy Jackson. Yeah, Dr. Billy Jackson. <laughs> surgeons are, aren't called doctor, they're called Mr. and consultants. Mm. Well, that's yeah, true. Like they're all doctors. But he was practicing. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, clearly this story has not grabbed our attention and <laughs> love since we're here debating Mr. vs. Doctor. So let's start on a high level. We'll start with Andy because I think I heard Gerald make a snore sound. So maybe Andy can start on a more positive. Or maybe not. It's, look, okay. It's fine. It was fine. It was a fun story. It's like, hey, look, here's a girl. And look, oh, it's Stars, Stars Rescuer. That's cute. It's good. It's you nice. And the summary. Yeah. That's a good summary. Yeah, that'll yeah. do. Yeah. Look, it's just it's just nice. It's like, oh look, little nice things. Um also, hey, how about fat people? They're the worst, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I think we are the worst. Who likes who likes them? Who could like them, eh? <laughs> so mean. Anyway. Yeah. Share Andy's opinion. That was weird. Um no, I didn't share an just been, I, uh, <laughs> I, di I didn't, I didn't, I read it once and I thought, what was that? And I didn't <laughs> understand. It. So I read it again more carefully and I just think, yeah, it's, it's okay. But the, the sort of the twist at the end just ruins it for me. Yes. <laughs> well, is it a twist? Yeah, it is, I suppose it is a bit of a twist, but you just think, what's going on? I don't know. Yeah. I'm really confused because it's apparently like one of one of O. Henry's more popular short stories. Really? Short stories. Short stories. Yeah. What? And it's taught in schools. And I'm just like, okay, so this is the second O. Henry story we've read. I think within a month or two months on this podcast, both submitted by Rami. Yeah. We'll miss him, <laughs> but maybe not the story submissions. Not being me, just being honest, because this story just like really, I just, at least the gift of the Magi had um an actual like lesson moral was kind of cute the narration was eccentric this one had eccentric narration too but we'll get into that in a minute um you know like that one had a point where it was like love and blah 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 is more important than gifts whatever like it's like a childish kind of like lesson but still timeless this one didn't even really have a lesson like it was just I, just, I don't know. I'm starting to get really fed up with these, which makes me feel bad because it's supposed to be like a master of the short story and I'm just not feeling it. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's too much wrong. You know, it, it's, it's, like, it's like it's written by somebody who isn't, it's, it's just learning to write because you know, the, 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 sort of, the sort of, well, you know, you said, let's be honest, let's be honest. Yeah, let's be honest. It's, it's, it's like... You know, you've got this sort of narrator who's who's there, but then isn't there, and then comes back at the end, and and there's like a, you know, breaks the fourth wall, and 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 you think, well, what what's the point of the narrator? I don't see that, and and the the whole point 
you know, the the, rep the repetition of the, the description of the house as if the narrator was looking for a room and ends up in the cheap room at the top. And then he introduces the main character, Miss Leeson, who then does exactly the same thing, goes through all the rooms and ends up in the top room. And you think, what was the point in that? I, I don't... The... <laughs> I think it was supposed to be funny, but it wasn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> my sense is like, oh, haha, Miss Parker, this is how she shows people the house. She has this like pattern she does every time. Ha, ha, ha. Like, I think that was the joke. Was it okay? I think so. I think Thank it was you. supposed to be funny, but it didn't work. At least for me, apparently for us, it didn't work. Nah. Well, what about where she tricks that guy into paying his rent? Ha, ha. Ah. <laughs> That's but funny. Yes, but you could have made that joke. Like, that joke was kind of funny on the first. Yeah, through, and it would have been funny on just one run through, like that joke. Uh, I don't, don't know. Sometimes jokes are funnier if you keep telling them, <laughs> despite the fact that nobody else is laughing. <laughs> you think? Okay. <sighs> and, uh, and I well, had to look. It up depends stuff. on who your audience is. Yeah, and I had to look up stuff. I don't like looking up stuff. I don't like having to look up stuff. Well, I love looking up stuff, and I still don't like the story. <laughs> lambrequins what the devil is a lambrequin i looked that up and cicerone and and stuff like <laughs> tuscogenial yes, what the so yeah so but but I, I i i so i looked up all the stuff on the first run through i thought i'll i won't sort of get trip over this the second time through so i'll get i'll get it up and i'll, I'll insert the little description in the text so i can so i can i can understand what what, the, what he's talking about and <sighs> I no. want to keep comparing this to the Gift of the Magi because as we talk about mm. it, I'm realizing he's doing a lot of the same stuff he did in the Gift of the Magi, but it worked then and it didn't work now. So one, it's the break in the fourth wall. When he did it in the Gift of the Magi, it always had purpose, right? It was always like, oh, she's here sobbing on the bed. Let's give her some privacy, look away for a while and describe the home. It was a great way to, to show, not tell their level of poverty. And it had this sort of um, wholesome, very polite tone throughout the entire um, story like when they start you know celebrating christmas together and they're having the little romantic moment the couple you look away again and he gives you some actual important information that's relevant to the rest of the story that has to do with the theme in this one he's repeating the same thing twice for no reason and then later he's like guys let's pause the storytelling to make fun of fat people <laughs> nothing to do with anything else I don't... <laughs> like, what? I think that's just because you missed what the moral of the story is. Oh. Oh, what is it? Fat people can never find love. That's, <laughs> that's the moral, moral of the story. That's, that's true. Moral. That's because immoral. That's an immoral of the story. It's because <laughs> Miss Leeson, I think maybe we'll find love with this star man. Um, <laughs> yeah, the beautiful, by, brilliant Dr. Starman. By wasting away. Don't need Get your man. Yeah. And all she had to do was turn aside someone who would have bought her some food. Because you know the fat guy's got food. Yeah, he was going to take her on a date. And she was like, no, I'd rather starve. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a fat man. And I found love many times. So so that's that's not true. Plenty of fat people find love, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. I mean, well, there's a part of me. There's a part of me that wants to say, oh, early 1900s, it was a different time, body positivity, but this seems excessive even for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just a little. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Andy? Yeah, just, I don't know. What else was written in 1908? Is it, is it clever for the period and we just don't realize it anymore because we're jaded and modern? Or, or was it always this doll no no because because we've we've read some really good clever almost timeless old stuff mm -hmm. and and we've also read some stuff that is definitely of the time and and so the language is a little bit sort of stilted and and a bit over descriptive which is which is a thing back then but the story behind it has still shown up and, and still and and we've enjoyed the, the overarching story and and that that sort of that that appears the style for me got in the way for others it didn't but this it, it, the whole story is just it's it seems it's like it's like it's missing a bit it's like i don't know and, and it obviously yeah. isn't because it's got that oh so clever ending that isn't really clever and and 
I know I'm rolling my eyes at that end. And again, comparing it to the gift of the Magi, it's because the plot twist in the gift of the Magi mattered to the whole story. She sold her hair to make money to buy him a Christmas gift that would match with the watch. There's a whole thing. And plot twist? He sold his watch to get money to buy her something that goes with her hair. Like the plot twist makes sense with the yeah. rest of the narrative and you're building up to it, right? Yeah. And this one, the plot twist, plot twist you didn't even see coming. Like by the time you find out she's starving, she's being rescued. I think, you know, and, and the star doesn't even feature heavily enough for you to suss out that something's up with the star anyway. So, you know, she's like, oh, I named it Billy Jackson. I'm like, oh, silly girl. Ha ha ha. By the time it's like, and here's a doctor, Billy Jackson. I'm like, what does this have to do with anything? Like, it's not. Okay. Up. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can work backwards. <laughs> Maybe it is clever and we're missing it. Okay. So, if the plot twist, if we assume it's relevant, then that must mean they're celebrating some sort of virtue she demonstrated okay. by wishing on a star and starving. What is the virtue? What virtue would that be? Uh-huh. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, was, I, I just think it's funny that, that, that the new guy on the podcast who doesn't like literary fiction is now defending literary fiction. <laughs> to, to well, the I just feel like... Timers. <laughs> Rami's not here, and he picked the story. Yeah, and you guys don't like it, so someone's got to speak up for this boring yeah. story. But you know what, Andy? I appreciate your willingness to think that way. Say, hey, we're all moving forward in it, and we're trying to figure out how we got there. We we can't figure it out, so let's work backwards. Let's assume there's a lesson <laughs> here. So Henry does that. Let's assume there's a whole point to this, and let's assume that there is some normative virtue or behavior that is being rewarded by having this wish come true. So assuming that. Can we find what that is? And we're still coming up short. I I think there's there's something in in something about sort of seeing seeing a, a speck of light in in a dark um, in a dark situation. Yes. So mm-hmm. maybe she she focuses on this and and maybe that's that light shines down on her and there's a Whoa! sort of thing and 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 perhaps that's you know you if you keep hoping and keep trying and and have this little spark of light then maybe you know you can pull through but then to call the doctor william jackson it's just a a clumsy stupid thing and 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 say ha 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 here's the twist she hasn't died and the doctor was dr william jackson did you get the twist (laughs) <laughs> and, really? Yeah, so I'm glad I'm glad you brought up the hope thing because we've been we've been negging on this thing so hard that we're like moving away from like the actual obvious themes here, right? Which are yes, hope that she is here in this coffin like thing. She's like at the bottom of a well. All of that is written out in exactly those terms, right? There's, it's like being at the bottom of a well, looking up, and it's finding that light, it's finding that hope, and it's never giving up. But if that's the case. What is she not giving up on? Like, what was what was her big struggle here? Like, what was the thing that she was, It wasn't like we were watching her, you know, uh, get kicked down, get kicked down, but never lose hope, and then all of a sudden it pays off. You don't see that either. It's just, she has a job. She hangs out with dudes on the stoop. The other women are jealous. She loses her job. No big deal. Like, so what is it? Is it that, is it just that she's pretty? Like, is it just that she's likable? We don't see her persevere to then have that you know never lose hope and it will be rewarded um lesson even mm. yeah is it yeah a lesson about not seeing for marrying an artist or a random fan holding out for a doctor is that the moral <laughs> of the story <laughs> i mean mrs parker every single time people were looking at the double parlor room she, she would they were like oh sorry i'm not a doctor and she'd get mad so apparently the doctor is like the ultimate catch. Yeah. So yeah, uh, be content in a tiny dark room, lose your job, mm-hmm. but continue being nice, except to fat people. Don't be nice to fat people. And uh, you'll get everything you ever wanted. <laughs> also, and- Mrs. Parker's a villain. Like the Dr. Starman yells at her when she's mm-hmm. climbing up the stairs. Yeah. But again, what is he yelling at her for exactly? The fact that she even rents out that room or the fact that like what what is she you know what I i'm think, saying well, yeah yeah she was in the way <laughs> she got yelled at for existing yeah, yeah. It, and and yeah. It, yes it, so so the ambulance man star doctor seems seems to be 
really annoyed by her and knows where the skylight room is and all this sort of stuff. So, mm-hmm. so there's maybe something sort of otherworldly about him, maybe perhaps. But then, but then he he comes down and he's, I don't know, he stopped he stopped and let loose the practice scalpel of his tongue, not loudly. Oh. Mrs. Parker, who crumpled as a stiff garment, and and you think, why? What did he say to her, and why did he say, you know, why was he so mean? <laughs> well, the, as you're talking, I'm thinking, is it maybe a class thing? Like, here's this woman who clearly has a lot of money. She's a, she's a landowner. She rents out these rooms, and there's like different um, levels of wealth. The double parlor rooms, the richest. The skylights, the poorest. And he's seen this before. So apparently there's many Mrs. Parkers. There's many homes in this way. And maybe it's just the fact that you're renting out this terrible room to people who are very poor. Is it exploitative? Is it something like that? Is it about how um, just shaming Mrs. Parker for the inequality that she is reinforcing by renting out this room that's terrible? Maybe. But you need to show that in the story a little bit more if that's the case, right? Yeah, and what she's supposed she's supposed to not rent it to her, and right. she, and, and there's a choice of rooms, so it's not like she's saying you know here's this here's this cupboard full of spiders and and slime and and <laughs> and wild monsters, and and it's like thirty dollars a week because that's all there is. It, it's you know you can have this room, oh you haven't got any money, you have that room, and then yeah. and then so it's it's very it, it's I quite like that. I think I think she, I'm sticking up for her. I quite like Mrs. Parker. Well, I don't like, well, okay. Not really. Pushing back on that a little bit. Just because you have a terrible room doesn't mean you should rent a terrible room to desperate people who are very poor and don't have better, right? That's why we have um, uh, coding standards for buildings and stuff, because if not, landlords will like lend stuff that's basically exploitative and terrible to people to like get money per like square foot. So like, I can understand if that's the argument we're moving in. But if you have this set in New York City in the early 1900s, you literally have tenements you could be working with to tell that story, right? Yeah. And 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 there was a level of of so it sounds like it's like almost like an estate or like a pretty big house. So already you're like not dealing with your typical lowest of the low living, you know, 20 people to a room story that you get with like immigrants in New York City if you wanted to tell that story or tell like something, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a better setting for that kind of inequality story. And I also, it took me out a little bit because like, I'm like, did this really happen back in the day? Because nowadays you would not have the doctor, the artist, the office guy, the typesetter woman, all living in the same building, sharing a bathroom or two, sharing a kitchen. Like that doesn't happen anymore. You won't have them all sitting together on the stoops. Like, yeah. felt, you know, which again is fine if you're trying to create some sort of point about class, but it's not being drawn out throughout. Mm. Yeah, maybe maybe she maybe he's saying that because she's she's new to the building and everybody likes her and people talk to her and they all sit together on the stoop. Maybe maybe she's bringing different classes together. Maybe there's a message there that we're all just people, really, and and she treats everyone the same, apart from the fat guy, obviously, because he's right. he's the lowest of the low. <laughs> <laughs> But they're not treated the same. She sneers at anyone who's not a doctor, and if you're so poor, she won't even show you the room herself, and she calls. No, I was, I was talking about uh, Leeson. The Leeson. Oh, Leeson. Yes, Leeson, Leeson. Yeah. yeah, she. You know, she she sits on on the on the stairs, and everybody gathers around, and they talk, and so so there's that sort of, you know, maybe that she's bringing different groups of society together. Yes, but it's it's if you're at the bottom of the rung and you're willing to entertain. The company of those above you it's not as impressive as being you know what i'm saying like yeah yeah it's not like you're bringing people together from the middle or from the top you know like it's that's you're not actually overcoming anything it's uh, actually good for you to be hanging out with people that are of a higher social class because maybe you can make the right contacts the right jobs to get out of poverty so and she did get a marriage offer so that was pretty good right but not off her own work off a star which again as andy was saying if that's to reward some virtue what is the virtue and that's not demonstrated no, I don't think so. The virtue of not being fat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one you're of the strongest. Up, huh? You're a little hung up on this, I think. <laughs> well, because like the strongest point of view, the strongest point of view in the entire story is fat people. We should laugh at them. Like that is the strongest one. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny, and and you know, he says, 
I pray you let the drama halt. So we're stopping what's to stop the story <laughs> because there's something I want to tell you about fat people yeah. in case you hadn't noticed. And again, so. remember when he did that and gifted the magic, it was like, let's stop the story. It was to talk about the three wise men who gave gifts to baby Jesus and how actually maybe they weren't so wise because it was all monetary and these people are actually wiser. Like he was setting up something that actually had to do with something. Like he, it, when he paused the story last time, it was his big point. When he paused the story this time, if it's also his big point, what the hell? What is this? Yeah. I think that's the point. That's got to be it. Don't marry fat people. <laughs> Starve to death it's instead. Starving. Maybe a yeah. star will save you. Yeah. If, you if, if you're starving yeah. and a fat man's like, let me take you out to dinner. If you say no and you waste away, a non fat man will come. Yes. Like, I just, I'm <laughs> sure that's not it, but my God. And, and there's lots of things like, like he had the thing where where he where the star doctor knows where the place is and and, and then he's a bit grumpy with Mrs. Parker and he says something to her and and he carries her out and then he doesn't he didn't lay her down on the bed prepared for it, um, and all he said was drive like hell Wilson to the driver. So I, it's I don't know I I it's almost like the star doctor this. Is there something special about him, and we're just not seeing it? And I, I don't. Sent from the heavens, he was sent. You know, I think the, the the line about how he doesn't lay her down on the bed prepared for her is um, to talk about a tenderness that he feels for her. I think it's like hinting at like maybe a romance. That's how I read it because he's holding uh -huh. in a way that a uh, uh, romantic partner would when someone is ill or a family member or a lover. But in this case, it, that wouldn't make sense. Mm. Oh, good. Mm, interesting. We're so angry. We're just no. I mean, I, I, I keep trying to find something positive, but it, I just keep going back to all the possibilities he had to make a comment on hope and perseverance, or on class, or on or on uh, having being in a humble place but continuing to have a chipper attitude and everything like that. It's not really demonstrating enough. Because she is chipper, but we're not seeing her be chipper in the face of hardship. No. So. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's such a shame. It, it, it's, you shouldn't have to work this hard to find out what the story is about. And, and even after I'd read it twice and, and scratched my head a lot and, and looked online, and there's just, no one else seems to say, aha, but there is this. This is the oh. message. It's just, it's a nice story, and it's all about you know never giving up hope and all that sort of stuff. Right, right, yeah. All the reviews are about not giving up hope, and I'm like, okay, but that's not. It's not enough. No. In the way that the story is written, no. it's not that we have to dig hard to find out what the story is about. It's for me. It's just like you were kind of saying. There's something sophomoric about it. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> Did I? Makes me want to cut a hole in my roof and look up at the stars. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's something. Do you have any comments, Andy? I thought I saw you starting to speak. Did you see? I don't know. Mm. Yeah. No, it's not frozen. Oh. I don't think he heard you say his name. Oh, Andy, I thought you were oh. trying to say something. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a particular point. I was trying to listen attentively. To Gerald as my internet went silly. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. yeah. This is going to be a very short podcast. Yeah, but you know, I. I, I feel like we're we're. I know I keep coming back to the same thing, but <clears throat> I think the reason all the other possible points of the story seem so ancillary is like, oh, it's about hope, but they don't. Yeah. There's hope, but they don't expand on hope. Mm -hmm. What they really drill down on is not to marry fat people and that Mrs. Parker's a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Right. So I think, I think Joe was saying we don't should have to dig this hard to find out something's about. I think it is just about hope and not losing hope and you will someday be rewarded. And what we're disappointed in is the fact that it's not doing enough with that. No. See, I disagree. I don't think it's about hope at all. I think the hope is a side, a side, <laughs> side note, and it's about not me. <laughs> and in that case, it 
that if we assume it's about that, then when he stops the narrative to tell us why this guy's such a terrible person, uh, because he's fat, right. then that is directly to the theme he's trying to explore. Right? <laughs> Everything else fits together. <laughs> Okay, so so if we just just for the sake of argument, so let's say that is the th- the, st- the theme <laughs> of the story, not, not marrying fat people, um, and why not? Why why shouldn't why shouldn't we marry fat people? I I don't, you know. Yes, yes. They he makes them like um, Hoover, you know. Hoover, 45, flush, foolish, and fat is meat for perdition. I mean, yeah, but why? What's, does it make him a bad person? It does. <laughs> a greedy person, maybe. I, I don't, don't think it makes him... No, it's not It's not that it makes him a bad person. It's, like, tragic and um, the kind of thing that's... Like, you're supposed to be, like, pitying him, right? Because... That one line where he just introduces it. He's like, uh, tune the pipes to the tragedy of tallow, the bane of bulk, the calamity of corpulence. <laughs> like, holy crap, this intro. And then, yeah. oh, you know, Falstaff was a fat character. Tried out Falstaff may have rendered more romance to the ton than would have Romeo's rickety ribs to the ounce. Like, he just is all in on this, like, pity them. Pity them. They are pathetic. <laughs> This is a bit harsh, and 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 when uh, even later on, when when she she comes in and uh, he asked her to marry him, and his fatness hovered above her like an avalanche. <laughs> you think, give it a rest, <laughs> poor guy. I quite like him. I want him to find true love. Maybe he'll marry Mrs. Barker. No, <laughs> no, no he's not a doctor. No. <laughs> Oh, is he? Is he the doctor? Actually, wait a minute. If he's the doctor, we've locked in. It's definitely about fat people. Wait, when she's introducing, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Miss Leeson came down. Typewriter looked around by a much larger lady. Oh, there's another fat person. Um, oh no. Okay, so it was just another big for her. I'm trying to find everyone else's positions. Um. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it doesn't say what they do. Mr. Skinner no. had cast from his mind as a star of a private romantic drama. Mr. Hoover was 45, fat, flush, and foolish. Mr. Evans, um, who set up a holocaust to induce her to ask him to leave us off cigarettes. <laughs> they don't learn their jobs. We're yeah, we don't, obsessed with her. We don't know where Mr. Hoover actually is in the house, do we? It never actually says whereabouts he lives. Yeah. yeah, what level of... Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that, that's important, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Right, because if he was the doctor, and just because he's fat no longer is Doctor the Catch, then this is definitely a fat-shaming story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, there's that line, um, to the train of Momus are the fat men remanded. So Momus is like the gesture. Like, they just... It's, it's all about how, like, pathetic they are. We should laugh at them. Uh, in the vein beats the faithfulest heart above a 52-inch bell. I just... No, in vein. I get it. it I, didn't, I read this, that line too quick. In vain beats the faithfulest heart of a 52-inch bell. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because the people she introduces... In the in the very first sections where she where you're introduced to the house, you don't know who 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 the doctor or or the dentist would be, but you've got Mister Tusenberry, and then you've got uh, Mrs. McIntyre, and then later on when we're sitting on the stairs, I don't think any of those come in. They're they're all different people, so I don't know. Miss Longnecker is on the stairs. Mm. Uh, Mr. Skiddy, yeah, we see here. Oh, and Mr. Evans. The artist. Yeah, I don't know. I can't be bothered to find out. Yeah. Anyway, not <sighs> in the story. Yeah. 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 The gift of the Magi was better, but even so, I don't think I like O. Henry, and I really need some O. Henry fanboy or fangirl to write in and tell me why I'm wrong. Because right now, I'm just like, uh, please the do. The Magi was way better. 
it's it's, it's it's like it's like Rami on, on his last on his last ever podcast as he was leaving the room, just threw a grenade into the room and said, "Here's a story," <laughs> 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 and, and ran away and go woohoo, chew on that. I don't know. And I feel bad because, like, yeah, you know, because he, he'd have, he'd have, he'd have, he'd have said it's a nice story. You know, he would he would have supported it and and he would have defended it and he would have been able to say, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but, um, and and here we are trashing it, not because he <laughs> suggested it, because we all love Rami. I also feel bad because, you know, sometimes when we read stories by authors who are who are considered masters or something like that. We always feel extra bad if we want to give them below a three, but I can't give this a three or higher. I, I did not, like, I, I'm, like, mad. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's funny. I, 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 well, we'll do scores in a minute, but, yeah, my, my score's gone down because I was, I was, I was hoping that, that I was just missing something and, and then I'd been enlightened in the podcast, but no. <laughs> it's not going to happen now. If anything, you read too much. <laughs> perhaps that's right. Yes, perhaps there was less needed. than you thought. <laughs> perhaps I just needed to read it once and very quickly, and then think, and then <laughs> pull my mind up. Uh, All right, never okay. give up hope because one yeah. day a star man will come and whisk you off your feet, quite literally. So, um, but he won't be back. So let's give our ratings. Uh, yeah, I, I I came in with a three and I've gone down to a two, I'm afraid. Mm. Andy? I'm going to give it a three because despite everything else, it was nice and not actively painful. And okay. Yeah. You understand three is the middle score, so like, yeah. the few three right. is not actively painful. Right. It's like, it's 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 lukewarm. You know, okay. it's it's okay. like a uh, tepid bathwater of a story. <laughs> That's a good analogy. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, yeah not All for right. Annalise though. No, I even feel like a two is too high. Like, here's the thing: I was coming in at a two, and as we discussed it, and I realized. All the potential themes that it could be, all the things you could have done that were cool, and just decided instead, let's laugh at fat people, makes me just like. <laughs> Why? You know, it makes me mad. I'm gonna give it one and a half. Just, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's and and I think that's probably generous enough. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> is it this story's fault that you thought of 17 better stories while you were <laughs> discussing reading it? it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's brilliant. It because, because the story should take you away and, and take it and mean <laughs> wrap you around and, and not think, what the hell is this story? <laughs> Well, maybe twist. that's the lesson it was teaching. Yeah. And, or if you're going to yes. have plot twist or some level of magic or magical realism, it really needs to be tying back to your theme. It really needs to be, you know what I'm saying? Like It, it needs to be doing something either entertaining, which this failed to do, or th that reinforces either a point or a theme or some mood. That, that's just not happening here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I said mood too because I'm trying. There's a story that I read, Elena Fronte. I love her so much, and all she was doing was reinforcing that the emotional turmoil that character was going through, and she had a copper pot explode off a wall. Wow. And there's no other magical realism that happens in the story at all, and putting that in out of nowhere actually worked. That actually worked in that scene. Like there are ways to use this um, that reinforce something that you were trying to describe, uh, and in this case, it just felt really. Like I said before, soft mark. Like that's the word. Like, <laughs> all right. Are we underestimating how important it is for a typist to marry a doctor? <laughs> possibly, but we don't know how they get married. But possibly. Well, he's a magical star man who descends from the heavens to save her life. They get married. They get married. But listen, but listen. Um, is it? <laughs> A deal though because over time we have gotten more rigid not less rigid with marrying across class lines granted always wealthier man marrying hot young poor woman not the other way around right pretty woman um, yeah mm. yeah exactly so is it i don't know was it that unusual for like some doctor to be like mm, she's fine break me off a piece, no matter how much money she makes because 
women aren't supposed to make money in that time anyway. You're just supposed to get mm. married to a housewife. So it's not like it makes a huge difference to their wealth. It, it might just be like inheritances are nice. Um, the super wealthy definitely marry the way that like monarchies would. But a doctor here isn't necessarily mega wealth. So yeah, he's no Rockefeller. Right, yeah. right. Like the Rockefellers and stuff, like okay, yeah, definitely there who the men and women marry is a bigger deal, but I don't know. <sighs> so this story made me wonder, it's game time. Uh, it made me wonder when all this wishing upon a star thing started and how it's you know been depicted throughout culture. Uh, so what are you guys submitting for next week? Well, I shall go for yet again for Haruki Marukami, the second bakery attack. Okay. Andy. I will be submitting Cream by Haruki Murakami. Oh, yeah. Because I thought that would be funny. Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't, we didn't discuss this beforehand. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Very nice. I like it. Okay. I'm going to go Andy first and then Gerald. So, okay. Andy, in which century was the idea of wishing upon a shooting star first recorded in literature? Or like the first oh. time the, that's how it originated. Uh, there's choices. <laughs> The 14th century, the 10th century, the 6th, or the 2nd? I'm going to go with the 2nd. It is the 2nd. Wow. Uh, so the belief dates back to around um, on, expand this. Uh, AD 127 to 151, when Greek astronomer um, wrote that occasionally, out of curiosity and boredom, the gods peer down at the earth from between the spheres. He stated that while this happens, star sometimes slip out of this gap flashing towards earth shooting stars are hence an indication that the gods are now paying attention to whatever you would ask for so shooting stars yeah. when the gods look down on earth awesome okay gerald yep. when was the song when you wish upon a star released 1920 1930 1940 1950 nope 1940 and it won oscar for best original song that year okay uh so andy who wrote when you wish upon a star howard ashman john cage and benjamin Britten, george gershwin lane Har lee harline and ned washington i'm gonna say gershwin nope it was lee harline and ned washington never heard of him either um <laughs> gerald who sings the song as jiminy cricket is it cliff edwards harry como Dean Martin, Andy Williams. Oh, um, the first one. It is Cliff Edwards. Okay, Andy. In the 1996 classic movie that is not at all bad and is actually very good, thank you very much, uh, called uh, Wish Upon a Star, two teenage sisters swap bodies after the unpopular sister wishes on a shooting star that she could be her cool, popular sister, and they immediately spend the next day trying to ruin each other's lives. And the cool sister in the body of the uncool sister shows up at school dressed as a clown, a dominatrix, Chuck E. Cheese, and Elijah from Lord of the Rings. Um, he Friday versions, I have not. Let's go with the clown. That seems a timeless fun joke it was a dominatrix somehow she went to high school dressed as a wow. dominatrix yeah wow yeah what was this movie rated <laughs> i think g or pg it was baby Catherine um heigl yeah mm, no don't know about that yeah. <laughs> so uh oh also by the way in the movie their parents know that this is happening and they're ruining each other's lives and they swapped bodies but they have just adopted a hands-off approach to parenting so they decide not to interfere Okay, <laughs> let them sort it out. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, uh, it'll prepare them for life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, this is a normal uh, sort of like teenage drama, and it'd be healthy for them to just you know sort this alone with no parental guidance. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Mm -hmm. So, Gerald, yeah. in Lilo and Stitch, what does Lilo wish for when she sees a shooting star? A dog, a friend, a brother, a spaceship. Uh, a dog. Nope, it's a friend. I didn't uh, think you were putting in dog because she tells people stitches for dog. All right. So we have a tiebreaker because each have one. Mm -hmm. So 
The, the American Film Institute ranked the 100 greatest songs in film history. Where did When You Wish Upon a Star rank? Whoever gets closest wins. So from 1 to 100. Um, I would say Lucky 13. I will price of right this and say 14. Oh, you should have priced it right the other way because it was seven. So Gerald wins. Wow. Hey. Yeah. I did not expect that. Seven? Me neither. I know. Seven right? greatest song in film? Uh huh. Hakuna Matata is 99. So whoever did this is just like something <laughs> soft in the head. All right. Hakuna Matata is amazing. <laughs> so a thought did just occur to me yeah. about the story. Oh, okay. go ahead. One you wish upon a star. It makes no difference who you are. Yes. Uh huh. Genius. Mm. Before that, but. <laughs> mm. oh. All right. Hey, she did. She did. I mean, she she did. I've closed the file now, but she did talk to it and blow it a kiss and and. Um, and it was like, all right, I'll marry you. Yeah, <laughs> like you would. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Didn't, ch didn't change the rating. <laughs> so, Gerald, what are we reading next week? Next week, we should be reading Haruki Marukami, The Second Bakery Attack. Okay. But before you go, tell us about your favorite star in our Facebook group, The Literary Roadhouse Readers, or Twitter at Lit Roadhouse, or our website, LiteraryRoadhouse.com. Are you looking for a story with more meat and potatoes before your literary soul wastes away to nothing? Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we discuss a novel each month. And lastly, we need to fix up all our windows with Lambroquins for obvious reasons. Please support our interior decor and podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the boarders on your stoop. Until next time, read a good story.